gonna be a father any second now. My father doesn't get to be here for that. That is very sad. But my mom gets to be here for that. And that is very exciting. I, you have to focus on the things that you lose and the things that you learned. What I wanna teach my, my child is to, to experience his loved ones to the best of his abilities with the, with the highest passion he ever he, he possibly can, right? To tell people that he loves them as as often as he as he can. I'm hoping my kid will be able to appreciate the beauty of celebration of life rather than the mourning of death, um, and how that exercise is actually a a way to lift the burden from yourself when you're suffering. To teach yourself to see the positive in the utmost negative is a cultural skill that Mexicans have. Jorge's song for his father is still a work in progress. He's hoping the right words will find him soon, but until then, Take a listen to his band, the Mariachi Ghost, and their song, Sempazuchu, which is all about the yellow marigold, the flower used to guide spirits from the day to day. How does it go just to get, do you see how other people feel about it? My name's Jade. This is my second uh, death cafe. I'm here because I'm uh, starting to go into uh, grief counseling and bereavement counseling for the queer community, specifically. Um, I'm queer and talking about queer death and dying, it's really important to me to be able to talk about that openly and kind of destigmatize that uh, and meet like-minded people and come together as a community. here feeling like they have a community, feeling like death is something that can be talked about, really kind of start a movement within the queer community about how do we deal with end of life issues. I just really want to get that conversation started. are everywhere. There's even a worldwide map to find if there's one near you. We have a link on our website. Just head to cbc.ca slash now or never. So picture this. Kind of a corporate looking meeting room. Long white tables filled with senior citizens diligently taking notes. And at the front of the room Rick Berg is sharing what he's learned about what it takes to prepare for a good death. A number of years ago, I learned the power of story. And it had everything to do with one individual getting ready to die. And that was my first wife, Pam. She was diagnosed with my son and my daughter, but they don't want to have it. How do you have that? Perhaps story is the way to begin. So when I do put my story down, it's going to have the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the best. And I've got two grown kids, and I, I realize that I need to pass on some of these stories to them because there's there's me there, there's life lessons that can really help them in their journey. When I got older, I wish I could ask my grandmother a lot of questions. It's too bad that I wasn't able to. I'm sure she would tell me all sorts of good stories. <laughs> What's so powerful about telling our story now is that we don't have to tell them when we're dying. We get to tell the story when we're living. And what a better way of helping our family and friends enter into a conversation with us then sharing those stories that are important to you that perhaps you would want to be carried forward. How do 
you do that? How do you figure out what the one story is that you want to be remembered by? Bailey's voice you're hearing. That's one of her best friends, Jen Irvin. After 25 years, they were much more like sisters than friends. Once Bailey knew what she wanted to say in her obituary, she asked Jen to help her type up the words that have now been shared around the world in the weeks since Bailey's death. Don't take the small stuff so seriously and live a little. Bailey is the most she passed, wanted to edit it one more time to make sure she got it right. Wow, yeah, it's important to get those final words right. Yeah, she really wanted to get a message across. She had no idea the impact she was making, but uh, it's kind of her little legacy she's leaving behind, so it's great. How would you describe Bailey? What was she like? She was always very sure of who she was. When she made a decision, a long thought of decision, she stuck with it. What was your first thought when you found out that Bailey had cancer? Completely devastated. Not only is this my best friend, someone I saw uh, as like a family member and sister, and the thought of not growing old together. It just forced us to live. It forced her to live. So what did that look like? It was trips. It was making memories with the ones she loved, whether it was gallivanting around Europe, um, whether it was going to Mexico, or going to see her friends at, you know, in new cities they lived in. It was just about making lifelong memories. And what did it mean for you to go, uh, go on those trips and have those moments with her? It meant a lot. I think it was forcing me to live in the moment as well. And I have these memories to last me, these happy memories to hold on to that hopefully get us through her loss. Were they all happy, happy memories? I can imagine those moments when you're with someone and knowing that these might be some of those last moments. There's definitely sad moments. There was definitely realization moments where this could be the last time I see her. So there's sad moments, but I think what pushed us through um, before she actually passed was just that she was still here. So we didn't want to mourn her before we lost her. Enjoying those moments is definitely what Bailey talked about and shared about in her obituary. Um, I think I love the last line of her obituary where she kind of issues a challenge to anyone who reads it, where she says, don't take the small stuff so seriously and live a little. Mm -hmm. um, how have you responded to that? I think it's caused me to be more present and not sweat the small stuff as much. I think you can so easily get caught up in our daily lives and not realize that how lucky are we to be here to worry about things. some things that can be so petty because, I mean, at the end of the day, none of us are getting out alive. We can not be so grateful that I have this chance to be here with her and be her mom. Um, it's forced me to really honor my friendships and check in on everybody, even if it's just to say hi, even if we have to do lives. I mean, obviously we have to, uh, you know, we have to work to live, but I think it's important not always to live to work. Since Bailey's died, have you found yourself rereading her obituary? I know that obituary off the back of my hand. I think I never realized how amazing it was in the moment because I, I just wanted to help her complete her checklist. And so now that she's actually gone, I can have so much more. A senior government official explains the new digital charter would set out overarching principles and every bit of policy that falls under the umbrella of online risks would be guided by those principles. It could lead to changes in the law to impose fines on web companies. As for what that could look like and how it would be enforced, the Liberals say more details will be announced soon. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Paris. Back in Ottawa, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer outlined his party's economic policies this afternoon. With a federal election expected in the fall, Scheer says a Conservative government would live within its means. My government will live within our means. If one of my ministers comes to me with a new project or proposal, I won't even consider it until he or she has figured out where the money will come from. Under my leadership, any new spending not already budgeted must be paid for from savings within the government. Scheer says he would kill the infrastructure bank the Liberals created and end corporate handouts. He's also calling for a coast-to-coast -coast energy corridor so it would be easier to build pipelines and power lines. 
Quebec's premier is welcoming news of a proposed deal that would see Air Canada buy competitor Air Transat. 30 years ago, François Legault was one of the founders of Air Transat. Justin Hayward has more from Montreal. Quebec Premier François Legault says today is a bittersweet day. Sweet because if Air Canada buys Air Transat, it means a Montreal headquartered airline will take control of the Quebec business. Bitter because of how much Transat means to him. It's a lot of emotion for me because, uh, of course, I was there for the first flight of Air Transat uh, with all employees uh, crying of uh, uh, joy. Legault says he's not worried about the loss of competition and what effect it might have on ticket prices. The Premier points out there are still several other airlines flying the same routes as Air Canada to sun destinations like the Caribbean as well as to Europe. While both airlines appear to favor the deal, it's far from done. The regulatory approvals are not certain and shareholders of both companies must okay any deal. Justin Hayward, CBC News, Montreal. And finally, Prince Harry has settled a lawsuit against a news agency. The agency's photographer hovered over his home in a helicopter, taking shots inside his living room and bedroom. Harry's lawyer says the prince received substantial damages and an apology from the Splash News and Picture Agency, but the amount of the damages was not disclosed. And that is your World This Hour. For CBC News, I'm Danielle Capelli. Hi, I'm Rashmi Nayer in for Jill Deacon. This is Here and Now. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland is in Cuba to discuss many things. The deteriorating situation in Venezuela, the American decision to end the suspension of Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. We're going to get into that. She'll visit Canadian Embassy staff who have complained of a strange neurological illness thought to be related to hidden sonar devices. So coming up on here and now, we're going to walk you through this Trump policy about Title III. We'll discuss that mystery illness. Also, Cuba's alliance with the Maduro regime in Venezuela. And we'll talk about what Minister Freeland can accomplish while she's there in Cuba. Amber Pay is here with a look at travel. Mm -hmm. And expect today's drive to be a little slower than usual as the long weekend approaches us. I know it's not Friday, but Thursday before a long weekend is also very busy. So we'll take a look first at the DVP as you exit the downtown core. And it is a slow drive approaching Dundas now all the way up towards York Mills. I'm peeking at us and the vendors are all setting up their way. It looks and smells amazing here because of the baked goods, because of the fresh produce as well. We're going to talk to some of these vendors here throughout the show. We'll get some gardening tips. We'll maybe even sample some oysters and I'll tell you what those are like and we'll talk about leeks. It's leak season. All that's coming up for now though. Let me give you your weather. It's 12 degrees currently. As I said, there are some showers that have been rolling through. Uh, the main line is still back to the northwest of us. So what's going to be happening is that we'll have some breaks in precipitation and then into the evening hours and overnight a repeat in terms of some of these wet conditions coming back to us. Some embedded thunderstorms not out of the question. Temperature will remain nearly steady coming down a little bit overnight. 10 degrees for the overnight low. Friday morning means we could have a little bit of patchy fog and some of the clouds and showers hanging in there but that's early morning. Then we get into a clearing trend and Friday although the winds are going to turn towards the northwest and so that'll be a bit of a cool breeze. Uh, uh, we'll see the sun coming out as the day wears on. Lots of sunshine and a high of 18. A nice way to head into the long weekend. As for the long weekend forecast, uh, there's still a few chances for some rain showers. It's not looking too bad. It looks pretty good. I'll talk about that at the bottom of the hour, Rashmi. Thanks, Paulette. Enjoy those oast oysters. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm going to sneak that one in if I can. I love oysters. <laughs> All right, Trevor Dunn's here with your headlines. Hi, Rashmi. Well, CBC News has learned that the Doug Ford government will offer municipalities help to find cost savings with their budgets. Now, as we've reported here at uh, Toronto City Hall, there is nearly a $180 million hole in the budget due to, city officials say, provincial government cuts. Now we're learning the province will give cities, including Toronto, assistance with what it calls value for money audits. We're hearing with some people involved with that.